Good evening, this is uh, Dale Weldon and we are in Theology 101. This is class number eight and we're doing lesson seven in the workbook which begins on page 39 entitled The Plan of Salvation Part 2. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, as we discuss uh, these essential, important, uh, beautiful doctrines of salvation, will you teach us? Will you give us humble hearts? Will you help us to, um, to take in what, what your word says, uh, to interpret it properly? and uh, to give ourselves over to your truth. And so we're asking that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, I, I, I have written on the board again, TULIP. And last week, or two weeks ago, we went through uh, the first two, total inability or total depravity and unconditional election. And today we're going to pick up with the third one. And um, I will just say right up front that, that often when people say, I'm a three-point Calvinist or a four-point Calvinist, this is the one they're going to have difficulty with, the, the, what, what is called in theology limited atonement. Um, if, they're, if they're a three-pointer, it's usually going to be this one and the unconditional election, at least looking at it the way we do. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you different words so almost on each of them. Uh, and I... I prefer, rather than limited atonement, to call it particular atonement. And that may, you know, again, some people might say, well, you're, you're just playing with words. Well, yes, I am, <laughs> because uh, limited has a negative connotation. Now, I like what he says here, and I'm going to go through this paragraph. Uh, look at the definition under limited atonement or particular atonement. The death of Christ secures complete salvation for all the elect people of God, but not all of mankind. Okay? So what that's saying is that when Jesus died on the cross, all of mankind was not, uh, was not saved but he died for a particular group of people. That's what we call the elect two weeks ago. This view is called the particular or definite atonement. Arminians who reject the reformed view that limits the extent of the atonement to the elect do not realize that they have falsely limited the power of the atonement in that if Christ dies for all and all are not saved, then men can thwart the very power and purpose of God. So let me go back and, and walk us through because that's an important, important uh, statement that we understand. So while I change the word limited, what we do need to understand is that everybody in their theology limits the atonement. From the Reformed or Calvinistic perspective, we say the atonement was limited in who it was designed for. That when Jesus went to the cross, he had all of his elect of all time in his mind. He died for me. He died for Dale. You can say that for yourself as well. He didn't die hoping that someday Dale might believe. And that's where 
the Arminian perspective that says he died for all, but then men have to decide they've limited the effectiveness of the atonement. Because if he died for everybody and everyone's not saved, then he failed. And I'm not willing to say that, and the Scripture doesn't indicate that. He came to seek and to save. And he did that. He actually accomplished salvation. He didn't accomplish something theoretical. So if, if the Arminian perspective is right, is that he died for everybody, and, and, uh, but not everybody saved, then actually when he died, he didn't know if anybody ever would be saved. What he went through could have been a big waste because there was it, it, nothing was accomplished. But instead, at the end, what did he say? It is finished. It's accomplished. It's done. What was done? The reason he came. To save his people from their sins. Matthew 1.21 his, you know, his name's Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Who's he going to save? Everybody? No, he's going to save his people from their sins. Okay? Yes? What about John 3.16? We'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I, I told you that when, um, when I first heard all this, that I rejected it. I was attending a church, uh, and the pastor was teaching these doctrines, but in the front of the church, it said John 3.16 up there. And that's exactly what I said to him. Wait a minute, I thought he loved the whole world. And the short answer is, he does love the world. But that doesn't mean that he chooses every single individual in the whole world to be his people. And, as it says in Romans 9 through 11, that's his choice. He's the potter. We're the clay. Can the potter do whatever he wants to the clay? Absolutely. Can he make some that glorify him and some that don't? Absolutely. That's what Romans 9 through 11 teaches. That's his prerogative. Can the clay say to the potter, why'd you make me this way? No, we can't. We're the clay. Then, wait, you maybe get to this later too about free will. Yeah, we're going to get to when we get to irresistible grace. Those are great questions, and if I don't hit them, take me back to them because I'm not avoiding it. I'm, I'm, I'll try to take us in some order here, okay? Um, but that don't don't hesitate to ask questions. But I, you know, I may say we'll get to that in a moment. So, okay, so. Let me also give you this, and I'm going to go through it really quickly. Um, let's see, do I save one for myself? Just grab one. I mean, no. <laughs> I, I did say that, didn't I? So. You did exactly what I told you to do. So. You're so obedient, yeah. Yeah. You know, with the coronavirus, we don't want to all handle them, so no. Okay, <laughs> this is, uh, now on one side, it says, look on the side that says, for who did Christ die? Okay, and on the other side it says, for whom did Christ die? Look on the, for who did Christ die? And I'll just explain, John Owen was a Puritan, and um, th this is exactly how he wrote it. What I did is, I, I, I made him so his English was a little better. I mean, who am I to do that? But, um, but I also made the, uh, the words a little more modern. So we're going to go through the side that says, for whom did Christ die? Where it says language updated by Dale Weldon. In case I messed anything up, I'm admitting it. So um, it says, uh, the Father poured out his wrath upon... Uh, it sh shouldn't say, and the Jesus. And Jesus took the punishment. Here's what he did. He did it either for all the sins of all people 
or he did it for all the sins of some people, or he did it for some of the sins of all people. Those are basically the three choices. In other words, um, when, when Jesus died on the cross, it was for all the sins of all people, for all the sins of some people, or for some of the sins of all people. In which case, the following can be said. If number three is true, that he died for some of the sins of all people, then all people still have some sins to answer for, so no one's saved. So it can't be that, right? Because we know some are saved. If number two is true, then Jesus Christ suffered in their place, and that is that he died for all the sins of some people. That's what we would say from a, a reform perspective. If number two is true, then Jesus suffered in their place for all the sins of all the elect in the whole world, and this is true. But if number one is true, that he died for all, all the sins of all people, that's what the Arminians say. And that's what those that want to say, for God so loved the world, well, that means he, he died for all the sins of all, every individual in the whole world. If that one's true, then why aren't all people free from the punishment they deserve? In other words, if Jesus died for all the sins of all people, why aren't all people saved? You might answer, well, they aren't saved because of their unbelief. And that is what the Arminian would say. Well, it's because they don't believe. Mm -hmm. Then the main question that should be asked is, is this unbelief a sin or not? If it is then Christ suffered for that sin too, didn't he? If he did, why would that sin keep them from salvation any more than any other sin? On the other hand, if he did not die for that sin, then he didn't die for all the sins of all people. So Jesus died for all the sins of all of his people, the elect. Now, that's a lot to take in. We're not going to dwell on this. I encourage you to kind of read it through a few times. And this side that I just read you is a little easier to read than the other side. Um, and I, I need to go back and fix the, the Jesus. Uh, that was, you see, I updated the wording and put a wrong word in there. Um, does that make sense to anybody? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let it let it ruminate. Let it you know. Let it sink in, and then read it a, a few times, and just kind of take it one sentence at a time, and and think about it. Okay. So uh, back to our workbook, page thirty nine. Christ's death was a substitutionary atonement. Um, and by the way, atonement. One way to remember that is. And this, that's not how the word is, but it at one meant. In other words, it, it reconciles us to God. It makes us, you know, reconciled to him again. That doesn't help forget it. <laughs> um, notice the Mark 10, 45. Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many. That's a limited number. Would have been a great place to say every single person in the whole wide world of all time. But it says for many. And then what did the Lord lay upon Christ? Our iniquity. Our iniquity. God's people. Okay. So look at the bold print there then. Christ's death guarantees complete salvation for all that he planned to save. He does not merely make it possible for people to choose or reject salvation on their own. He guaranteed it. He accomplished what he came to, to do, as I mentioned earlier. And then on page 40, Christ's atoning death applies specifically to the elect. You just go through each of those and you can see that each one and that's why you could call it definite atonement. Each one is a definite group of people, not an indefinite group of people like the Arminians would say. His people, his sheep, many, the church of God, those who are called, all of those limit, you know, we have the word world in John 3.16, and all of these tell us 
it can't be talking about every single individual in the whole world. Okay. By the way, and at the end of this chapter, there's some good explanations about world also. Um, the world passages. Okay. Um, let me let me give you an example too. Uh, why the word world can be there, um, or and the word all. That's the other one where people say, "I thought he died for all people." Well, uh, let's say okay. Um, uh, Carolina uh, won the national championship. Maybe we should go with our women's basketball. That may be the only chance. So, okay, let's go with that. Um, only one believable. Yeah. Uh, Carolina wins the national championship, and they had a parade, and all of Columbia turned out for them. Now, that's not a lie. That's how we talk. The Atlanta Braves had a victory parade, and all of Atlanta turned out. But we know when we say that, that it's not every single individual in Columbia. We know it's not every single individual in Atlanta. It's a way, it's a way we talk. It's not a lie. It's a truthful statement in the way we use language. And there are some statements like that in the scripture. So what you do is if you have a very broad statement like world, and then you have others that are much more specific, you've got to define the word world or all by the more specific ones. That's just in, in you know, syllogisms in, in language. That's just how, how you do it, not just theology. Okay? Um, let's, let's look at the irresistible grace, but... Ask me, ask, ask me questions before we leave the limited or particular atonement. So, an individual who's from eternity past is one of the elect. There's no way that they would you know, reject salvation, say no to salvation. That's what we're about to hit. Okay. But I would, I would say... Yes, that's correct. The, the question was, if you didn't hear it on the tape, um, uh, that if someone is the elect, there's no way that they, they will reject salvation. And I would say, that's correct. Now, that doesn't mean they might not reject it the first time they hear it or something like that. It doesn't, you know, it's not an automatic. But what I would say is, there's no way they will be eternally condemned. They will not be lost. Okay, that might be the better way to put it. Uh, because I know a lot of people that have rejected salvation, reject, 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 and then come to Christ. You know. I have a question. Yeah. Arminianism and what Arminians taught, isn't it? I've always thought he's kind of creeping back toward Roman Catholic doctrine, mm -hmm. is what yeah. it seemed to me. Catholic doctrine is Arminian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is. Um, but they, you know, even they don't say everybody's saved. Right. Because you have to cooperate. <laughs> well, well, and you've got, you've got to be in that, their church, yeah. their branch of the church. Yes. You have to be in Holy Mother Church. Yes. So, yes, but yeah. their theology would be um, closer to Arminianism. They don't, they wouldn't call it that. But. Right. Okay, um, irresistible grace. Did anybody need, need any duct tape to keep your head from exploding yet? Yeah. Okay, you do? All right, yeah. Well, bring your own next time. That's all I can say. Yeah, yeah I know. You know, remember what I tell you. Press and release. You know, um, don't, don't let it get to you. Think about it. Pray about it. Study. And then Relax. Think about it, pray about it, study some more, and then, then relax. Um, and see if that helps anyway. All right, the uh, irresistible grace. Let me give you a, cu a couple other possible words, either 
efficacious, or the word we would use is effective grace. The reason I prefer not to use the word irresistible is because that sounds to me like somebody wants to do one thing and they are being forced to do something else. And that's not the case. That is not the case. Nope, no, you know, God doesn't have to put our arm up behind us and force us into salvation. He gives us a new heart, and then that grace is irresistible at that point. I'll give you the illustration here uh, in a minute, but let's read the definition. The special working of the Holy Spirit. By the way, this is, this is again, we're talking about regeneration. Some of you were asking about that. The special working of the Holy Spirit in the life of one of the elect, whereby he is given the eyes of faith, and his nature is so changed that he freely accepts Christ as he is offered in the gospel. So you ask about free will. Did you see what it says here? His nature is so changed that then he freely accepts Christ as he is offered in the gospel. So here's, here's, let me say it in a lot of different ways and see if any of them, you know, make sense to you. We are only free to do what our nature is. In other words, what we are by nature, that's the only thing we're free to do or to be. Like, I may want to fly without an airplane, but in my nature, I can't do that. So I'm not free. And there is no such thing as ultimate freedom. And anybody that says there is has not thought it through. Okay? People want to talk about their own free will and everything, but we're not, we're not free in our society. I, I can't take someone's life. I can't abuse somebody. I can't steal from somebody. We are not free. We're in a free society, but we are free to do that, you know, what is permitted within our society. Um, a, a goldfish in a bowl is totally free to be a goldfish in that bowl. Can't be a bird, can't be a person. He can be a goldfish. Okay? Likewise with us. Do you remember back with total inability? Let's go back to that illustration. You have the, the dead person up here. What What is he free to do at that point? What can the dead person do? Be dead. Yeah, that's it. He can't do anything. Why? Because that's his nature. His nature is he is dead in his trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2 1. Okay? He's totally free, but he can't save himself. He can't make himself better. So, the healer walks along. The healer is Jesus. Okay? He walks along, and here's this dead corpse that can do nothing, can't respond can't say, please help me. There, there's none of that, okay? And what he does, he says, that's one of mine. He's Right now he's dead in his trespasses and sin. But here, here's a new heart. Regeneration. I'm going to put this new heart in the chest of this dead person. Start it pumping. And then life courses through, you know, this, this once cor- uh, corpse and now there's life there and the, the, the one that was dead opens its, uh, his eyes and sees the healer and then is free to say, yes, I want you. And that's what's going to happen every time. When this one is given a new heart and a new nature, He will not open his eyes and say, no. That's what the scripture, I believe, tells us. He's not going to reject the one that has given him a new heart. And that's why it's called irresistible, but I like the word effective grace. When God puts his grace on us, 
It's that effective. Let me, let me give you a kind of a cool example. Um, let, uh, in Luke 19, Luke 19, um, that is, and I'll just tell you what it is, it's uh, Zacchaeus. Now, I, I love the children's song because it, it's very accurate with the scripture here. But I don't know if you know the children's song or not, but I'm, I'm not going to sing it to you, but I will say it to you, okay? Uh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. You know, we kids do this. I always think, boy, that is a wee little man, you know. But a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior walked this way, he looked up in the tree and he said, do you know it? Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today. I'm going to your house today. That's the song. If you know that song and believe it, you understand irresistible grace. Let me explain. <laughs> okay, we're in uh, uh, Luke 19. We see it starts out, he entered Jericho, was passing through. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. Now, this is from the human perspective, okay? And by the way, I went to Missouri Baptist College, and I, I've heard this preached. Look, we need to be like Zacchaeus. Maybe you've heard it preached this way. We need to be like Zacchaeus. Look at him. He's seeking the Savior. If you seek the Savior, then you can have him. Okay, well, we, we got to look a little deeper here, okay? Um, he was seeking to see who Jesus was, uh, and what that simply means is he wanted to see this guy, okay? But on account of the crowd, he could not. So, it, you know, it's, he was literally seeking to see him um, because he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Now, let me tell you what just happened here. So Jesus is coming along. Zacchaeus thinks he's looking for Jesus. Jesus walks along and he calls this one that he knew before the foundation of the world. He calls him by name. He calls him by the name that he knew that he was going to go to the cross for. And he said, Zacchaeus. Now, who was really in charge here? Was it Zacchaeus or was it Jesus? It was Jesus, okay. Zacchaeus, uh, um, come down. And then there is a word here for I must stay at your house today. I don't know what your versions say. Uh, any different versions? Okay. Um, in the Greek here, the, the term is and this sounds really weird in English, that's, and this is a good translation, I must stay at your house. But it is the, 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 a real true translation would say, I must needs be at your house. And that's the strongest possible way to say, this is absolutely going to happen. Okay? It's not, would you let me come to your house? Or... Thanks for being there. I, I like what I'm seeing here. I'd like to... He said, I'm coming to your house. Now, what did he do when he came to his house? Well, he, he took salvation to his house, and we see that he came to Christ. Today, it says in verse 9, salvation has come to this house. For the Son, Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So, anyone that would preach, we need to be like Zacchaeus, who's the center of that story? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Yeah. His works. 
Who's the center of the, the way I just explained it to you from the Scripture? Jesus. He was the one in charge all the time. But that's, a, that's such a great illustration, going back to free will again, is that from our perspective, like if you're thinking back to when you came to Christ, you might say, well, I didn't feel like it was irresistible. I just wanted to come to Christ at that point. Well, of course, that's our perspective. That's exactly how we're going to see it. Did you do it freely? Of course I did it freely. Nobody made me come to Christ. You can't make somebody come to Christ. So here, here's a way I've seen it described um, from God's perspective and, and from ours. So over, over the door, it says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, or whosoever will, let Him come. And we say, I do want to, I want to go through that door. Yeah, I, that's, that's my desire. I'm going to walk through the door. And then we walk through the door and we, we look back at the door from the other side, from God's side, and it says, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. So we see that from our side, of course, that's where the, the idea of free will comes in. So that we never feel violated. I, I totally believe in irresistible grace, but he didn't have to force me to do anything. He gave me a new heart, and, and I saw him, and I, I, I went to him. And that's the way it works. That's why it's effective or efficacious grace. Okay, ask me questions about that. Um, is it okay to pray in- uh, for the Holy Spirit to move in someone's heart? Absolutely. We absolutely should be doing that. Again, because remember two weeks ago, the question was, is it okay to pray that the Holy Spirit would move someone's heart? I do that daily. I do it, you know, every Lord's Day. God, will you work in people's hearts today? Give them a new heart so that they can hear. You know, give them ears to hear. Um, I, I absolutely do that because we don't know who the elect are and we should never presume we know who the elect are we don't know so I, I treat people as if they're the elect I call them to Christ as if they're the elect if you're talking to somebody you don't never say you know what if you're the elect you ought to pray to receive Christ I would never say that I never use terms like that i I call all people to Christ. That's what we should do. You need to come to Christ. Now, I'm not worried that that I'm going to upset the, you know, God's plan and and somebody's accidentally going to get into heaven because I called them to Christ. (laughs) Because they're not. If they don't have a new heart, I'm talking to a person that's spiritually dead. And they're not going to come to Christ. But if they come to Christ then I don't get the praise. God does, because He's the one that gave a new heart. Yeah? I wrote something down uh, when we went over that section um, that kind of addresses what she said. Pray then not that a certain person come to Christ. Pray instead that God will allow my evangelism to be heard by those chosen by Him at the beginning of time. So it's kind of that, a subtle shift. That's a good that. way to do it when you're talking in general. Yeah. But I don't have a problem with us praying specifically for family members. Because I, you know, I want God to work in their heart. And we're supposed to tell them what we want. So, yeah, I think it's both and. That's a great, great way to pray, though. But you always pray for God's will be done. And that's what... Yeah, that's why I say I'm not worried that I'm going to mess up his... You know, that there's going to be one more in heaven that he wasn't planning on or anything like that. Uh, and the, uh, the flip side of that is, you know, if someone is the elect, I'm not going to mess it up by not doing a good job the way I share Christ either. So it's, it's not all about me. It's all about him doing the work. Now, we need to be faithful and, you know, and winsome and all of that. Um, I need to be clear when I share the gospel uh, because I don't want to I don't want to hinder somebody who who God's working in their heart, you know, but I'm not I, I'm also don't walk around with the fear that that somebody is going to go to hell because I messed up. 
I couldn't handle that pressure. But that also is why some churches will have long, emotional, pressure-filled invitations, altar calls at the end of at the end of their service. And I would too if I thought it was all about me getting them in there. I would too. I'm not blaming pastors that, you know, if they're being consistent with their theology. I have asked for Baptist pastor that if you believe in the sovereignty of God, why do you sing 22 verses just as I am? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it yeah. what you say you believe. Is, is that one reason that the Presbyterian Church doesn't have an altar? So, speak louder so I don't have to... Re- is that one reason that the Presbyterian Church doesn't have an altar? The Methodist Church had an altar. Yeah. Well, the, the main reason we don't have an altar is because there is no altar anymore because Jesus fulfilled the, the idea of an altar. Now, that's just a part of what they call their church. But it, it is, the altar call is the idea of going there and, and putting your life on the altar. Um, so we, we just don't, we don't call it an altar because Christ fulfilled the idea of the altar for us. Yeah. And I'm I'm not opposed to calling people to Christ at the end of a service or anything like that, um, but it, that's why I describe the the altar call or invitation as long, emotional, sometimes guilt producing, that kind of a thing. I was a youth guy, and I uh, when I was in in seminary, and we used to take our our kids to Youth for Christ things. I don't know if you remember. Have you ever heard of Youth for Christ? Okay. Well, it was a big old deal, and and they would show these movies, um, usually about the end times, that were meant to. I mean this literally. I don't mean it as a cursing. Scare the hell out of people. Okay. And they would. I mean, they they it would it would scare you, you know. And here I got all you know the kids in our youth group and. Then at the end, they would give an invitation and they kept saying, the buses will wait for you. Your, your, your youth guy will wait for you, you know. And, uh, you know, and then they'd say, okay, only one more opportunity. And then they'd say, the Holy Spirit's telling us there's somebody else out there and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, it got to the point where I began to wonder if I was a Christian. Cause, you know, am I the one they're waiting on, you know? And so, so we... We quit taking our kids to it because kids that I knew were believers were doubting their own salvation, you know. But but I understand that if they, if if like I said, if I thought it was all on me, you know, I wouldn't want anybody in this room to to you know in a big room to to be condemned because I messed up. Or, so anyway, okay. The, the last one is maybe the least controversial of all of these. And Arminians don't, don't hold to this, but our Baptist friends and, you know, hold to the perseverance of the saints. The other word I'm going to give you is preservation of the saints. Because I believe there's two sides to it. Um, and here's, here's what it's, it, the definition all God's elect have secured have secured eternal salvation through faith in Christ and shall be glorified by him in the last day. So in other words, if you if if you are the elect and you you come to Christ, you cannot lose your salvation. Okay? Now, some want to use the term once saved, always saved. I I don't think that's necessarily the best term because sometimes that's misused a little bit in this way. Um, I I would say, if you let me define it, I can use the term once saved, always saved. And, And the way I would define it is, if you really are saved, yes, you're always saved. But one of the unfortunate ways this is sometimes used is somebody will walk the aisle and make a profession of faith and then never show up in church again. And their wife or their husband is saying, well, at least they'll be in heaven because they, you know, 
They, they got saved. Have you, you, have you ever heard that term? They got saved. I don't use that term. I understand when people use that term what it means. But instead, what I say is, if somebody um, prays to receive Christ, what I would say is, they professed faith in Christ. Because I don't know if they got saved or not. Time will tell. But if somebody walks the aisle, makes a profession of faith, and never shows any fruit, I don't have any reason to believe they were saved. Because the Scripture says there will be fruit, there will be works that confirm your salvation. So that's the idea of the the, um, perseverance is you will persevere to the end. But the preservation is, uh, and I've used this illustration in, in sermons before, is, is that, that God holds on to us. He preserves us to salvation. And, you know, again, let me, let me just use the same illustration that I, I like to use on that. Um, when my oldest son was our only child at, at the time, he was kind of learning to walk and... Uh, we, we were up in Pennsylvania, we were leaving a, a Kmart and walking across the parking lot, the road part toward the cars. And I said, hold on to my pants, Nathan, or my pocket, Nathan. And he, you know, he's a little guy and he's holding on and I've got packages and, and uh, he stumbles and falls. And there's cars, I mean, they, they were stopping, but they're saying that's a bad dad right there. And I was, it was a bad dad moment. I had many of those, but because uh, he fell down. And so, uh, you know, I picked him up and, you know, got to the car and everything. He was safe and everything. Well, from then on, I didn't say, Nathan, you hold on to me. I said, give me your hand, Nathan. And I, I took his hand like this. And when he stumbled, which all children do, I just, you know, pick him up and put him back down and he didn't fall down at all. Well, that's the way it is with God. If it was up to us to hold on to him, we would lose our salvation. But instead, he's holding on to us. And when we stumble, if we are really his, we won't be lost. We may stumble, we may keep stumbling but he's not going to let us go. And that's what the scripture says, John 10 and other places. There's great scripture in here about our own security. No one can snatch them out of my hand. That means Satan can't snatch us out. It means we can't snatch ourselves out of his hand if we're really his. Yes. I have a question. Um, when I was applying for my graduate program, one of the application questions was to share when you were reborn. Hmm. Interesting. And I... Where, where, what school is that? CIE. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I took exception to it because I was like, why do I need to be reborn? I was born a Christian. I mean, I just always felt that Jesus was my Savior. It was what I was taught in Sunday school very young. Okay. I, I didn't ever really doubt it. Yeah. And so they were looking for this aha moment. Yeah. And I, and I just wonder, like, is that necessary? Am I less of a Christian because I've never had this aha moment where I have been reborn? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, there are all, all of us come to Christ different ways. Uh, everyone does have to be born again. Everyone has to have a new heart, even if we believe from a very young age. The only reason we do is because he he chose to give us a new heart at a very young age. But I don't have any problem with, and and some of my children, that would be their testimony, say, I don't remember a time I didn't love Jesus. Now, they didn't know everything about Jesus, but they loved him and they, you know, and they professed their faith in him and so on. But the only reason they did that is because God had already given them a new heart. So... Yeah, they probably were looking for a moment, and some people have that. Some people can put the date down. This is when I walked forward. This was the camp. This was Bible school this year. This is the date. I have the card in my pocket because the guy gave it to me because I actually did that with people um, at times. 
long ago. Um, I don't think it's a good practice, but um, some evangelism, I've, I've, I've done a lot of different kinds of evangelism. Some of them encourage that. If they pray a prayer, write down this date, and then you can look at the card and you know you're saved. Well, I'd rather them look at the Word of God and know they're saved. But anyway, you know, many people can tell exactly. Um, but here's the other thing is um, they are looking at being born again like I told you is not really the way the Scripture looks at being born again. Because being born again is when he gives us a new heart. It's not actually when we pray some kind of prayer. So there's a little difference in theology it's there. It's not when I made the decision to accept Christ as my That's what they're savior. looking for, though. Yeah. I will just tell you yeah. that. And so if somebody asked me that, I would know what they were looking for, and I would tell them to the best of my recollection. But if, if we were talking theology, I'd say, now, the only reason I prayed it then was because he'd already given me a new heart sometime before that I can't tell you when he gave me my new heart so yeah good question okay um, just I, I want you to look at the rest of the chapter where it, it talks about the world passages and uh, God's decree and God's will to save some and we can talk about any of those next week when we begin, if you would like. We're stopping for tonight. Um, and But we are going to go ahead, if we, uh, assuming we're able to, and go ahead and uh, start Chapter 8 next time. Okay? Any questions that are just burning that you won't be able to sleep for a week if I don't address them tonight? Yeah, it's a week away. Yep. Okay. Isn't this fun? Isn't theology fun? Okay. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, um, for your word. And uh, even though it might kind of uh, rock what we think are our foundations, your word is our foundation, and you are. So help us uh, in the areas that we're struggling. Um, give us your insight. Um, don't let anyone in this room just take my word for it. I, I would pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and convince us of the truth. And now we pray that you'd be with us as we go from here. We ask for your safety that we do not take for granted um, and help us to get home safely in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.